Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the third in a new series of webinars from our LN Economics that are focused on assisting the industry through these unprecedented times. My name is Victoria Toza Pennington, editor of LN Economics magazine, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. If you require any technical support at any time during the session, use the chat button located at the bottom right of the page to ask for help. Do submit any questions you have for the speakers at any time during the presentations using the Ask Your Question box, which is beneath the player window. We'll have time close to the end of the webinar to pose some of the questions to our panellists. Do specify if the question is for a specific speaker. We'll try to answer many of them. If we run out of time, we'll get back to you personally after the event. Slides will be shared after the webinar by request to me, please. And so on to today's event. Over the past three years, the aviation finance market in Korea was developing rapidly, with many more investors taking an interest in the sector, but that was before COVID-19 hit. In place of airline economics growth from Tia's Korea conference, which was due to be held in March, but is now postponed until 2021, expert speakers today are going to provide an overview of the market before the crisis, how the pandemic will impact, inv impact investors now, and the realities for transitioning aircraft in a depressed market. Although we're focusing on the Korean market, the subjects and issues raised today are applicable globally, of course. So opening the discussion is Val Devander, who is Chief Executive Officer of Koreans Aviation, as well as Managing Director and a Minority, Share of the, majority Shareholder of East Mercia Capital. Valder was inspired to join aviation by his father, an aircraft broker, and has been active since the 1990s. During this time, he's enjoyed the many highs of the industry, but he's also successfully navigated his ventures through the various industry crises. Thank you, Belda. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon to Korea. Victoria, thank you for having us at this webinar, and also thanks to you and your team for all the good work in keeping our industry connected in these challenging times. I would like to share our view at Crianza Aviation regarding the current situation. I will also provide an outlook, especially with a focus on white bodies, which are key to our strategy. But first of all, allow me to briefly mention our team, which has been working from home for the last eight weeks. This picture is a few months old. Today, everyone will have much longer hair due to social distancing rules in Germany. My thanks and appreciation go to the team, which has managed to ensure that East Merchant and Crianza have met all commitments without fail and we have been able to support all of our clients as if we were working under normal circumstances. This is very impressive, thank you. Coming back to Crianza Group, let me start by explaining for all of those who may not know us so well in Korea, that while Crianza is a young venture, only four years old, its protagonists at AMS and East Merchant are not. Looking at Mike Skinner, Patrick Giese, and myself, we each have been in this industry for 20 and more years and all of us have weathered various industry crises. So many things we're seeing now is a deja vu. And also we have at our side our partners from IMM and Cerritos, each of which is a market leader in their field. To give you a brief update from last year's Seoul conference, we added two 787-9 aircraft to our portfolio last year. Also, Crianza was able to further strengthen the group by taking a significant stake in East Merchant and it has the option to increase its shareholding to a majority position. Furthermore, our team managed to successfully remarket a 747-400 freighter and has been awarded remarketing mandates for two 737-800 as well as two A330-300 aircraft. I'm very happy about this as it demonstrates that we're just as experienced in the narrow body markets as we are in the wide body markets. And this is confirmed by our client mandates. And of course, we're very proud that we received the Remarketing Deal of the Year Award in January for the 747 Freighter Remarketing. So what is our view of the market? and Where do we see it going? You will have heard so much about this in the many webinars being offered, and you will have heard a lot of speculation, especially on aircraft values. Sometimes, to me, it seems that we're observing a bidding war. Who publishes the lowest value? even if there are almost no actual trades going on right now to support this. Let me rather focus on some specific thoughts and observations, which I find interesting and insightful to share with Korean investors. When Crianza started building its portfolio in late 2016, early 2017, it was obvious that the market was very strong, 
with signs of overheating, especially in the narrow body sector. While this was a favorable environment to raise funds, it was also clear to us that sooner or later, some kind of disruption would lead to a temporary downturn. And this is something we told investors. But it was also clear that demand for travel has been and will continue to be resilient enough to lead the market back to growth. The ingredients of our strategy at Crianza are wide body aircraft, which are key to our lessees fleets, combined with truly first class credit lessees and long term leases. In order to achieve competitive lease terms as well as competitive returns, we add a structured finance approach to our highly customized transactions. Today, the average life of the leases in our portfolio is around nine years, with around $1.6 billion in contracted lease cash flows. Thanks to this long average life, current speculations regarding aircraft values are not really relevant to us. We see ourselves as an investor with a long-term focus, and so far, our strategy has proven itself during this harsh downturn. And while we are, of course, discussing with our clients how we can support them, this support may be of a non-traditional nature, just as our transaction structures are non-traditional. So what do we expect for the future? Today, around 60% of the narrow body and the wide body passenger aircraft fleet are parked. It's obvious that domestic travel will pick up before international travel does. And we're seeing this not only in China, but for example, also in Korea. I heard that during last week's golden weekend in Korea, flights to Jeju Island were fully booked and hard to get. Our team looked into this. And indeed, during the golden weekend, there were almost 1 million air travelers in Korea. There were more than 4,400 flights to and from Jeju Island alone, with over 90% of last year's capacity. Of course, this does not mean that demand in general has already recovered. But there is a natural desire to travel, and accordingly, slowly and steadily, in regions hit earlier by COVID-19, the market already seems to be coming back. Now, will the global market immediately jump back to the level of 2019? Of course not. This will probably take two to three years. Also, international travel will take longer to bounce back than domestic travel. And it will take longer for wide bodies than for narrow bodies. Jumping to 2021, with the market being smaller, I expect two trends for the aircraft fleet. Excess aircraft and, initially, demand for smaller aircraft. In 2019, the fleet of roughly 20,000 Airbus and Boeing passenger aircraft was operating at an average load factor of above 80%. This fleet is obviously too large today. From that fleet, over 5,800 aircraft, or 27%, are older than 15 years. Most of them will be removed from the fleet, either because they are excess or because they will be replaced by new deliveries. Let's play this through. Let's think about a reasonably strong airline with a well-structured fleet, both age-wise and financing-wise. What is it going to do regarding its fleet? It will have certain order book commitments, even after possibly deferring some of them. It has young aircraft, which it has either purchased outright, financed, or leased. And it has a subfleet of older aircraft. The new deliveries will be included in the fleet. They're coming and committed. The leased aircraft are locked in, and the younger owned ones have not yet been amortized. So while fuel prices are at historic lows, and this could favor older, less fuel efficient aircraft, the only part of the fleet which the airline can deal with in a flexible manner is its older, fully amortized aircraft. These aircraft will be left in storage. This is actually not dissimilar to what we saw after 9-11 or the world financial crisis. I've heard numbers of between three to three and a half thousand narrow bodies and one and a half to two thousand wide bodies, which may not come back into service. In most instances, these will be the oldest aircraft. And I know that Phil Seymour from IBA will have some more slides on this later. This will probably result in a temporary collapse of the secondary market for older aircraft, as well as the collapse of the prices for part out spare parts of these aircraft. It will also mean a very difficult next few years for the aftermarket MROs, 
because airlines will look to preserve cash by maintaining green time on their engines and destocking spare part inventories. Based on Creanza's strategy of investing in new aircraft with long-term leases, our fleet should not be affected. Now thinking again about our example airline, we should keep in mind that we're in crisis times with deeply read P&Ls for airlines. So from an airline management point of view, if your equity position is robust enough, this may be the time to clean up some balance sheet items, harmonize the fleet, and get into a position to show a positive P&L in the following years. Or in other words, on the white body side, I would expect that older subfleets such as the 767, the 777-200, the A340, and the 747 are retired. I believe we will see down gotcha, bringing back smaller aircraft first. This will apply both to the narrow body and to the wide body fleet. On the wide body side, which Creanza's strategy focuses on, we first see the A350, 787, and young A330 aircraft benefiting from this development. Now moving on to my next topic, reflecting on the Korean market, investments in the A330, the 777, and the A380 have been very popular here. Especially some of the A330s placed in Korea reached the end of their leases last year. So, as time is limited today, let me briefly focus on this aircraft type. For us at Crianza, Korea is our one and only home market. Although Crianza was not affected, we've closely monitored the A330 situation in the Korean investor market. Also, we had developed a potential solution for Korean investors, even if they were not our direct investors. At that time, there were close to 60 A330 aircraft out of service due to airlines failing or in difficult situations, such as Jet Airways, Avianca, Thomas Cook, as well as airlines connected to H&A, but also due to a fleet adjustment of Etihad, which alone put 23 A330 aircraft on the market. This had temporarily disrupted the A330 market. Today, for obvious reasons, around 60% of the A330-300 fleet is part. I would expect a large part to remain in operation, clearly the more than 480 A330-300, which are 10 years and younger. While old 767s and 777-200s will be retired, young A330 aircraft are well positioned to take their place. An important factor here is the A330's operator base of over 100 airlines. This is the largest number among white bodies and is a distinguishing aspect for the A330. Now, will this happen immediately? No. But that is why aviation investors are long-term investors and they understand that aircraft have long useful lives, giving them time to achieve investment success. Also, I would like to remind you that the A330 is probably one of the most versatile wide-body aircraft in operation. Borrowing this chart from Airbus, and thank you very much to them, it shows various kinds of ways the aircraft is actually used. There are short-haul, high-volume routes. My favorite is actually Kuala Lumpur to Singapore, because they're literally next to each other. And there are nine to 10 hour flights, which could be something like Incheon to Prague. From our point of view, these strong metrics will not be diminished by the current crisis. Young, used A330s have optimal capital costs and attractive trip costs, and are positioned ideally to play an important role as a low-risk aircraft for airlines when rebuilding international traffic. To add one last thought on the market, we see this as a time to support airlines, but also to secure attractive investments. We've seen a good number of opportunities, but these will not last long. We've also seen some lessors invest significant amounts, finance or lease aircraft for prime clients. I would like to encourage you to consider this because soon we will once again have too much money chasing too few aircraft. But on that note, I've taken up enough time of yours today. Thank you very much for allowing me to comment on Creanza Aviation and sharing some of my broader thoughts. Let me close by saying that we know there will be a silver lining for the aviation market, and that is how we are positioning Crianza. Back to you, Victoria. 
Thanks very much, Matt Felder. Um, so now we're going to hear from Mike Skinner, who's CEO of AMS Aircraft Services, which is a UK-based aircraft remarketing, technical services, and technical management company. Mike started his life in the banking industry, specialising in big-ticket asset finance and leasing. In 1992, he joined Fortis Aviation to head up its aircraft remarketing and advisory services business. And six years later, he was one of the founders and CEO of Cabot Aviation, the remarketing company. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, good afternoon to all of you in Asia who are listening. Good morning to those of you in Europe and to anyone listening in America. I'm not really sure why you're up at this time. Um, but uh, if you are up, then thank you for listening indeed. What I'm going to talk about today is just really some generalisms about aircraft remarketing because as Balder pointed out, and as uh, I think everyone is probably aware, uh, the world has changed. There's a lot of aircraft that are uh, out of service in storage, and not all of them are going to uh, come back uh, into service again, certainly not with the airline that they're currently attached to at the moment. Uh, but first, before I move on, let me just give you a 30-second uh, preview of uh, or uh, of AMS Aircraft. The company uh, has been in business since 2001, and we have a uh, our principal office is in the UK, uh, and we have a uh, second office in Spain, uh, Zaragoza. Uh, our two principal uh, activities are aircraft remarketing and acquisition. Uh, we tend to do more remarketing than acquisition. That's partly out of choice and partly out of just the way that the industry works. Um, the second side of our business is technical management and inspection. And that covers a really wide range of, uh, uh, of uh, sub-activities. We inspect aircraft. We take deliveries of aircraft. We take re-delivery of aircraft. We manage uh, the uh, maintenance on aircraft. Uh, we sometimes manage the fitting out of an aircraft, particularly VIP aircraft. Um, and uh, we audit uh, aircraft records uh, and generally you know, cover the whole range of technical uh, matters related to aircraft. What we don't do is physically work on any aircraft. Uh, we don't send our engineers on with uh, uh, any equipment other than uh, a camera uh, and a torch so they can actually uh, look at an aircraft and find out if there's anything uh, that's wrong with it. Uh, our client base, which we've built up since 2001, covers the spectrum of people in the industry. Uh, there's airlines, there's the financiers, uh, investors, uh, and lessors. Uh, and within there, you have different types of uh, finances, different types of investors, and different types of lessors. Uh, some are clearly, some of the lessors are extremely large. Uh, and as we've seen uh, from industry news over the last few weeks, some are out there doing some fairly large sale and leasebacks and building up their portfolios, whereas others who perhaps not as large, not as experienced, are uh, uh, really struggling to come to terms with the fact that pretty well all their lessors, oh, sorry, all their lessees uh, are looking for some form of relief on lease rentals. And over the 19 years that uh, we've been in business, uh, we have undertaken projects in uh, not all the world, but certainly 50 countries. And uh, if I just show you this uh, map, uh, then you know we haven't done much in Africa, but then no one else has. Uh, we haven't done anything in Greenland, which is the uh, bit to the right, the massive island to the right of Canada, uh, and we've done very little in that area in the Middle East of uh, uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, and other stands, uh, and. Whilst uh, we've still got some countries to go, uh, we feel that uh, 
the number of countries that we've worked in gives us a pretty good feel overall for uh, what happens in different com uh, countries, their cultures. And that's quite important, particularly when we're remarketing aircraft. So, remarketing aircraft. We try and keep it relatively simple. There are lots of graphs and charts that the industry produces uh, and which analysts need to uh, keep track on what's happening. We are much more simple. We look at uh, aircraft and look at how difficult is it to uh, remarket them. And when we started doing this, it was a pyramid that came to mind uh, in terms of, uh, and I'm going to show you the difference between January and May. But in January, as you can see from the slide, uh, there was a huge number of aircraft at the bottom of the pyramid where I think we would describe as certainly never easy, but certainly not difficult to remarket. Uh, and it's easy to put the A320 family, the 737 family, uh, not just actually NGs, uh, some of the uh, classics, the 737-400 in particular, uh, have been very marketable aircraft for some time. And then in the center, you have the difficult aircraft. And they tend to be the A330, the 777, freighter aircraft. Uh, there's not been much of a market, a secondary market yet in 787s, so I don't think we kind of put them in uh, to qualify. Um, and then you go to the top of the pyramid, uh, and the point describes A, it's difficult, very difficult, and B, there are not that many of them, and there are not many operators. Uh, and the obvious candidates are the A380 and the 747. Uh, as it happens, we've never had, been, had the opportunity to market an A380. I quite welcome the challenge. Uh, but we have had the opportunity to remarket a number of 747s, uh, and uh, they have been difficult, but we've got there. And that was in January to 2020, and for probably around 12 years before January 2020. Uh, maybe 12 is too long, 11 years since 2009, uh, after the 2008 crash, when everything was very difficult. And then over that 11, 12 year period, the industry smoothed out, it's all been working well, and you get back to this regular uh, description, easy description of remarketing difficulty. And then look what's happened. In today, uh, the pyramid's inverted, and down at the bottom, you have in the not difficult, very few aircraft, and those very few aircraft are freighter aircraft. Uh, and as you're looking at that, you're probably working out relatively quickly why freighter aircraft are particularly, uh, are, have moved from being difficult to not too difficult. Uh, but conversely, uh, the A320s, the 737s, the A330s, and the uh, 777s have moved up to the very difficult. And this, remember, is May 2020, does not necessarily reflect where aircraft will be in this very simple chart uh, in uh, at the end of this year or maybe you know mid next year. Uh, it is uh, almost certain that it will all change and come back. Uh, what I want to look at now, having shown you what's difficult, what's not difficult, uh, is to look at today's uh, a few aircraft in today's market. Now, the thing which surprises me when I looked at this was that the wonder aircraft, the, the workhorses of the industry, are the A320 and the 737. Uh, not the 737 MAX for reasons unrelated to COVID-19. Uh, but uh, these are the two flagship aircraft uh, and the ones which have always been deemed less difficult to sell. Well, actually, 
looking at the number in storage and the number in service, uh, the, the A320 is 67% of the fleet in storage. The Boeing 737-800 NG, 57%. And strangely enough, I haven't rigged the figures, but the Airbus A330-300, which was in the difficult range and now moved up like the rest of the very difficult, uh, was also 57%. So actually, there's you know there's the same percentage of 737s parked up as there are A330s. And perhaps even more surprisingly for me, the 777-300ERs, there's only 48% of the fleet parked up. And then I come down a little bit further to 747-400 freighter, uh, only 17% of the fleet stored. There's not that many aircraft in the fleet. You compare the number of nearly 5,000 Boeing 737s to you know, 210, 220 uh, 747-400s, uh, 400 freighters. Uh, clearly, there's a big jump in the number of aircraft, uh, but it's the 747 freighter, which is actually faring better in terms of the number of aircraft still in service. And if I can just focus a little bit on the 37 747-400s, which are not in service, uh, the reason why the majority are not in service of those 37 is that they have been parked for some time. And as we know from a transaction we did in 2019, uh, it takes a long while to bring a 747-400, whether passenger or freighter, out of storage if it's been in for some years. Uh, it's just simply the, well, there's four engines, the airframe, the landing gear, uh, all the ADs which have fallen due while it's been stored. Uh, so tremendous amount of work. And quite frankly, if that work could be done in a couple of weeks or a month, then I think most of those, or a lot of those 37 aircraft that are parked uh, would be back out in service. And then I come down to the last in my list, uh, the Boeing 747-8F, the newest of the variants from the 747 fleet. Um, and uh, again, the numbers are low in terms of total aircraft built, 91. Uh, four are in storage and 87 are working. Uh, it's 4% only because I'd round it up. Uh, you know, the, the true percentage uh, is probably three point and I haven't worked it out. Uh, but it kind of shows again that there is some uh, freighter, you know, it's freighter aircraft which are currently working and probably will be working and I've seen some utility uh, utilization reports on freighters uh, where in the uh, four months this year, uh, in January wasn't too bad. In February, the utilization dropped down. In March, the utilization shot up. And in April, it continued to shoot up to the extent that it could. Uh, and the uh, uh, so I just found this an interesting comparison as a remarketing guy is that, uh, yeah, maybe things aren't too bad uh, for some of the uh, wide body aircraft. And in terms of what we're doing at the moment, we have three projects on. Uh, and I sort of play a little game. You'll have to mark yourselves and how good you are. Uh, but uh, we've got two 737-800 NGs two A330-300s and three 747 freighters. Uh, now, in two of them we're remarketing and one we're trying to acquire. We're acting as the acquisition agent. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you can probably guess what goes where. Yeah, we're remarketing 737-800s, uh, A330-300s, uh, but we're trying to acquire 747-400s. Uh, remarketing, in a sense, is simple. Uh, if you look at it and approach it like this, 
Uh, it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to sell aircraft or to buy aircraft, uh, but it's pretty easy to work out in, in a particular market uh, what type of work you're going to be looking for. And what I wanted to just do next was just talk through the implementation of a remarketing strategy. Uh, firstly, it's identifying potential buyers and lessees. This may be a blatantly obvious statement, but you know we know lots of people who whose idea of remarketing is sending out the details of their aircraft they want to sell to their 12 best friends in the industry. Uh, on the grounds that one of them might know someone who wants to actually you know, buy an aircraft. Um, we tend to do it a bit more professionally than that. Uh, and when I say a bit more professionally, that's English understatement. Uh, we do it a lot more professionally than that. Uh, firstly, we identify potential buyers and lessees. Uh, and that's through research, through understanding who's doing what in the industry. Uh, and we will uh, find, we'll probably put, for any single type of aircraft, we'll probably be looking at 200 to 250 airlines uh, around the world that could or would buy the particular aircraft that we're marketing. Uh, and within that, list of companies, we have a sub-list of individuals in those companies that are in some way or other related to the process of buying an aircraft. It could be finance, it could be fleet planning, it could be technical, it could be routes. Uh, when an airline is looking to acquire aircraft or retire aircraft, it actually, uh, it's not just the input of one department. Uh, it's generally the input of several departments, and the larger the airline, you know, the more the input from other departments. Uh, and uh, so when we end up with a list of which individuals should we contact at which airlines, we can end up with maybe 1,500, 2,000 people uh, at the airlines we've selected as being appropriate to remarket this particular aircraft to. Um, when we've got our list, we then categorize the target prospects by their potential. I mean, that just makes sense. So we have category one, category two, category three. We tend not to have a category four, uh, but category one uh, is literally the more obvious can, uh, buyers of aircraft, of a particular aircraft. If you're selling a 737 or an A330, then in category one, you put existing operators of a 737 and an A330. Uh, you'll also have other people in category one that maybe you're selling a 787, 900. Uh, you might put people in who uh, don't have any, but actually operate 767s or 787s. Um, and then once we've got our uh, list of potential buyers and we've uh, categorized them, we then send out mail shots to target prospects. Uh, and uh, those mail shots tend to go with specifications and with information as to where uh, a the aircraft are available and b uh, where they can people who are interested can get the aviation uh, can get the technical specifications. Uh, it's uh, we always have a pretty similar type of return. Uh, we track uh, who's opened the uh, uh, the mail shots we've sent. We track who's looked on the site with all the technical information. Uh, and so we can watch what's happening generally with the project. And of the two, two of the, if I take two of the current projects, the 737s and the uh, A330s, the 737s has been running uh, pre-COVID. Uh, COVID has thrown problems uh, in the ongoing uh, uh, program for the 737s, but the 737 mail shots started before COVID was even heard of. Uh, the A330s has started during COVID. Uh, normally, we would get expect to get, of every mail shot we send out, we would expect to get 
something like 25 to 30 percent of the people that it's sent to actually looking at the email, slight less do it looking at the uh, um, uh, specifications of the aircraft. Uh, but so 25 to 30 percent we would expect. Uh, on the first meltdown of the A330s, it was down to 15 percent. Yeah, quite a marked difference in terms of people who had even bothered to look at the email and to read the email. Um, so we sent out a second uh, mail shot three weeks later, um, which again is in, still in the COVID. Uh, we took out all the people that had actually looked at the aircraft, uh, sorry, looked at the, uh, uh, the mail shot first time around. Uh, and so everyone that this, the second mail shot went to uh, had not looked at the first mail shot. And well, lo and behold, another 15% of people we sent it to on the second mail shot took the time to look at the email. And I also, I don't have the number with me, but a percentage looked at the technical specifications. Uh, we would never normally send out a mail shot uh, three weeks after the first mail shot, we'd certainly wait a bit longer. Uh, but, you know, we just felt that it was the right thing to do, and I think the returns showed they were. Uh, in addition to sending out uh, a mail shot, uh, we place uh, details of the aircraft, the very basic details of what type, what year, what engine type, uh, uh, in industry publications and websites. But in truth, uh, and I'm not dismissing the uh, publications and websites at all on this Victoria. Uh, it uh, uh, the majority, by far the majority. In fact, I can only think of a couple of aircraft which we've actually sold through a listing, uh, because the majority of people that we think are going to buy are already picked up in our list of prospective and potential buyers. And so the majority come from that, from direct contact, rather than from listing. Uh, I talked about distributing the aircraft specification. Clearly, it's important. You know, aircraft can be uh, uh, it can be adapted. You can change the interiors, but clearly, if the if people, airlines who are looking at thinking about aircraft want to look at what the configuration of the interior is, what engines are on, what the avionics are, uh, to see how compatible it is to what they already have in their fleet or what they would like to have in their fleet. Uh, we then make physical contact, not physical in the terms of turning up on their doorstep, which is pretty impossible now, uh, but physical in terms of uh, direct contact with uh, uh, Pro, uh, the category one and two prospects uh, to actually talk to them on the telephone and just find out if they're in the market, if they're not, when they're going to be in the market, if, and uh, and things which help us to decide how hard we push someone or uh, where we leave someone alone and actually uh, concentrate on others. Uh, and then, move, then when we've got narrowed down, we maybe send out 1,500 emails to people. Actually, what we really, if we can at the end of that 1500, if it can filter down uh, to where we get 10 or 20 potential interested parties, then we start negotiation. Uh, and it goes from there. Uh, and what I want to do next is actually just go through the life story of an aircraft. It's very rare that you actually, anyone in the industry, I suppose, well, certainly on the remarketing side, has some involvement with an aircraft at each stage of its life. And this is one which I did. Uh, but it, there is a message that comes through from looking at its life. This Airbus A330 uh, was delivered by Airbus to Swissair in 1999. Uh, there you can see the aircraft in the Swiss Air colors. But 
In 2001, we had the 9-11 crisis. And at the time, yeah, clearly that was a serious crisis. Uh, there was a market downturn. Uh, Swiss Air failed. And it's almost impossible. No one thought anything in Switzerland could fail. Uh, you know, Switzerland was like the, you know, the diamond of the, uh, of the world in terms of its banking systems, uh, its generally perceived wealth and stability. Swiss Air failed. And the aircraft was put into storage. And if we move on to 2002, in two, it took from uh, 2000, the end of 2001 to the beginning of 2002 for the administrator of uh, Swiss Air to sort out whether he's going to keep aircraft, return aircraft, make the aircraft bankrupt, whatever. Um, and that's still happening today. Uh, and uh, you can look at Virgin Australia, you can look at Flybe in, uh, Flybe in the UK, you know, airlines which have gone under but are still under the control of the administrator, and lessors do not necessarily know whether they're going to be able to get their aircraft back. In 2002, this aircraft was one of three returned uh, to our, one of our clients by the administrator of Swiss Air. Uh, and the remarketing began, and by 2002, there are no buyers anywhere. Uh, we produce our list, but there are no buyers. Uh, and if we were going to sell, market prices had tumbled. Uh, as now, it's being perceived they will tumble now. Uh, through the marketing, Lufthansa, we found out Lufthansa, who had never leased an aircraft before in its entire life, uh, hard to think of in a day time when people are leasing, but in 2002, Lufthansa had never leased an aircraft. Uh, it turned out they were waiting for the delivery of some new aircraft, uh, Airbus A340s, and uh, but they needed some additional lift, and so in 2002. We agreed a deal with Lufthansa where we were leasing the aircraft to them for two years. Uh, the lease was at the start of 2003, the delivery, because we had to prepare the aircraft to, uh, to meet the delivery questions required by Lufthansa. Uh, but it was a very low rental. The rental was probably a third, 25% um, to a third of what uh, the rent was before 9-11. Uh, but the benefit that we and our clients saw was that whatever the rental, we, there was some income coming in, and as importantly, there was no expenditure going out. There was no storage costs, there were no maintenance costs, there were no insurance costs, or indeed any other costs uh, that the lender at the time uh, uh, would have to incur. So the deal made sense uh, because we knew that in two years' time, it was going to go, come back, and uh, we'd get another attempt to actually um, sell the aircraft or lease the aircraft at what would then hope to be better rates. And so the aircraft it was in Lufthansa colors. So the photographs you're going to see are all the same aircraft. And in 2005, we had, we'd had, or by 2005, we'd had two years of you know, very easy life with Lufthansa paying every month. Fantastic. And in 2005, the market had recovered. There was a strong market, lease rates were doubled, and there were good sales prices. And the sale was agreed to a smaller airline in Germany called Blue Wings. I'm going to move on swiftly. Uh, the aircraft was painted in Blue Wings colors. Um, but in 2005, still, the Blue Wing sale was cancelled. Uh, that is a completely other story. Uh, it was, in fact, a, a sanctions fraud, it turned out, and uh, caused grief to a lot of people, uh, including us. Uh, but uh, we, the aircraft never flew for Blue Wings. Uh, by now, uh, we're in 2006, 
but the aircraft market had got even stronger. Lease rates had retired and bounced back, as I'm sure they will from the current uh, uh, problems. And sale prices were higher. And in 2006, because of the price we could obtain, the uh, aircraft was sold to TAP Portugal. But TAP Portugal were going to uh, lease the aircraft, uh, but then decided they would actually buy it and do their own sale and lease back. So the aircraft went into uh, TAP Portugal colours. 2006, TAP Portugal agreed a long-term sale and lease back. Uh, and from 2006 to 2019, the aircraft was leased and operated by TAP Portugal. Um, 2019 was the end of the line for the aircraft. Uh, TAP Portugal decided to retire it, and the aircraft was parted out. Uh, so it had a life of 20 years, uh, had four different uh, operators, if I include Blue Wings, um, and, uh, but it shows that if you're in an, if you look at the long term of an aircraft, yes, there are going to be things that happen on the way. There are going to be events such as SARS, 9-11 and others. Uh, there may be events like we had the problems with Blue Wings where it didn't quite turn out as we thought it would, uh, that you have to resolve. Uh, but I kind of feel that it, from a remarketing point of view, this is how I view, and I'm not an investor, I'm not an analyst, so I have to tell you this is very much from a remarketing point of view. Uh, the, in market peaks, you sell. In market norms, you hold and look for long-term leases. And in market lows, you still hold because you don't want to sell at a loss and look for short-term leases. Uh, I could expand on that, but I haven't time. So finally, the remarketing of an aircraft. And I just hope that this has shown you that uh, to all investors and lenders that uh, whatever events throw up, they can generally be resolved. And uh, Balder's mentioned some of the problems that's going to come post-COVID. Uh, Phil, I'm sure, is going to tell us all the problems which currently exist. But from a remarketing point of view, I think that some of us in the industry uh, are suitably experienced to deal with the type of problems that have come up uh, to protect uh, either investors or lenders. Uh, and that's it. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand back to you, Victoria. Thank you, Mike. So our final speaker today is Phil Seymour, who is company president and president of IBA, which he originally joined in 1997 to head the technical management team. His career began with British Airways as an air transport engineer, and he subsequently held positions in several airlines before qualifying as a senior appraiser in 2002. In 2018, Phil was bestowed the title of appraiser fellow by the ISAT Appraisers International Board of Governors. Thank you, Phil. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Victoria, and uh, yeah, thanks to Airline Economics, and thanks to my uh, fellow panelists, Baldor from uh, Crianza and Mike from AMS. It's a pleasure to join uh, this esteemed panel. Thank you. Um, as far as the um, uh, IBA goes, just a very brief introduction. I hope a lot of you uh, use our services in any case and have probably seen some of our products and services. We have been in existence for over 30 years. We have over 60 staff based around the UK and worldwide. We have six ISTAT certified appraisers, five of which are seniors, uh, and myself as senior appraiser fellow. But we also have a team of 21 full-time analysts across the valuation and advisory business. That's because we do split the business down into commercial aircraft, business jets, turboprops, regional jets, engines, and spare parts inventories. So we're very active uh, performing uh, annual valuations for airlines and lessors and financiers. We do have an active asset management team. Uh, we do see real live data, maintenance costs, values and lease rates. Uh, we are currently placing six A2 2300s, uh, which we've been managing through the production cycle 
uh, at the um, factory in Montreal. Also, we have an active technical management team. We're busy inside airlines, transitioning aircraft, so we build up a strong technical knowledge and maintenance and airline experience. I do want to start with just a, a reminder of, of the aviation industry as it's evolved and some of the, some of the things which drive the, um, uh, the demand. Uh, in, this, in this graph, we're really looking at um, how GDP growth, so the green line, uh, which is showing GDP growth, which has generally been very positive. There was a, a, a blip in the global financial crisis, but overall around the world, that GDP growth, the green line, has driven uh, RPK growth, which is the uh, which is the uh, yellow line here. Um, that does obviously mean revenue per passenger kilometer. This isn't really looking at the freight market; it's looking at the passenger sector. But overall, that RPK growth has meant that aircraft need to be ordered. So we see the blue bars are the net orders of aircraft. Because of the production cycle, uh, when you order a new aircraft, of course, it's some time later till that appears. So the orange bar are the numbers of deliveries. And the key thing here is that in the last 10 years, we've seen the, the OEMs really ramping up production in order to meet the demand in air travel. But I think at this point, it's really worth reminding us of you know, exactly where we fit in terms of airline profitability. This uses IATA data, and this, this is headed up, and it, it, it's something we just need to focus on as, as investors in the industry. This is the difference between investing in airlines and investing in similar assets elsewhere. And it is something that we do need to remind ourselves that really it's only been the last five years, in fact four years, 2019 was not a brilliant year in terms of airline profitability. But actually, it, as an industry overall, airlines have been tough in terms of providing any returns on investments in the long term. So I do think it's something we do really need to remind ourselves that, uh, that the panelists here have seen several downturns and perhaps we are reasonably aware that the airline industry uh, does not always return a profit. So in the current situation, uh, what decisions will be going through the airlines in terms of you know, what they can do in the current situation? Well, faced with a significant drop in demand, airlines will go through many decisions on establishing sustainable liquidity, cutting overhead costs, but also capacity management will be key. Looking just at the fleet they manage, there are a number of options and they're, they're relatively easy to deal with. And those that will provide, uh, will, will, could become harder, sorry, prove to become harder or impossible to take. Of course, this is only an example because every situation is different, but the basic trend repeats in every down cycle. Starting on the left, the easier decisions, clearly the oldest and least efficient aircraft could go provided they don't affect flexibility. Those aircraft that are not part of a lease or with only a limited term left could be removed from the fleet uh, with potentially a lower penalty. Although the financial terms of a lease return may be significant, such as this could slip to the right-hand side in terms of what's difficult to remove from the fleet. Those aircraft in need of heavy and expensive maintenance will be an obvious choice. And on a similar point, those that are expensive to operate in terms of cost per seat which could point to fuel burn and maintenance costs or reliability issues could be stored more quickly. Naturally, the largest aircraft are currently very vulnerable as it becomes difficult to fill those effectively. And this has manifested itself uh, in the past where we've seen a resurgence of the A319 at one end of a downturn and a push away from the 747 at the other. Removal of those highlighted for conversion or retirement at some point in the near term Will be easier to act upon, although the decision is being brought forward. Last but not least, there are considerable numbers in long-term storage that it may prove simpler to just leave them where they are. Moving to the tougher decisions on the right-hand side, this essentially identifies those that will be safest to remain where they are, providing there's sufficient demand to keep them in service. In previous downturns, it's been the focus, there's been a focus on keeping the youngest and most efficient types in service, 
and that is usually the mantra maintained by all participants in the industry. They may be more expensive to acquire and finance, however the refleet process must proceed at some point regardless of the fact that oil is so cheap at the present. Oil pricing we expect will rise eventually, environmental measures will kick in and consumer appeal will overtake the argument eventually. It may just mean that an alternative view on how they're financed is considered. Next to those aircraft faced with heavy penalties should they be removed from the fleet, such as leases with distant expiry dates. Whilst more difficult to track, aircraft that have undergone a significant refit recently will also fall into the safer category. Although I should stress that I have seen plenty of wide bodies go from the refit process and into storage uh, as the aircraft plan changes. Those aircraft fresh from maintenance, unless they're leased, are less likely to go into storage, although similarly with refits, it doesn't ultimately stop aircraft going to storage if the operator has to cut the fleet down. Moving down the list, lessors that are willing to support airlines will be looked on favourably, so those aircraft may remain. And finally, the last one I want to mention was the effect on near-term deliveries too. Whilst these aren't in the fleet per se, they will likely supplant an aircraft in the fleet that's already in the fleet. As it gets closer to the, de to the delivery date, the options for the airline diminish such that they have very little choice but to take, take it in. Now I want to get into some detail uh, and analysis here. This is quite a, a busy chart where we're looking at the narrow body fleet scenario. Taking this one stage further, we can run a simplistic scenario of the narrow body fleet taking into consideration the expected deliveries that will push out aircraft given the drop in demand, plus also any stored aircraft in the process of reactivation or are between leases. So if I look at some of the detail here, uh, the scenario here considers that there's a, an oversupply of 2,500 narrow and wide body in, uh, aircraft in the market which gives us broadly a two-year horizon on where RPKs will settle out against the 2019 number. This doesn't specifically account for a 50% drop in RPKs that expected for 2020, but more where the new norm settles by the close of 2020 and for 2021. Of course, this is still pretty much guesswork. We're still in a period where the rules and regulations imposed by governments are still unclear. On the left side, and let me just zoom in here. On the left side, we have the backlogs as they stand, covering narrow bodies, which almost, uh, bear with me. Yes, here we're looking at the uh, the, the the new aircraft which which. Uh, could be delivered through 2021 plan, but also we've, we've estimated that these will these will fall back to uh, uh, way below what what should have been delivered. We've also got the consideration of the max. Here we've assumed that the max re-enters service in September and that the fleet is slowly reactivated. Finally, there's an estimation that we've made for the 20 month period based on the announced delivery rates from Airbus and Boeing. It also assumes that the MAX re-enters service, as I say, in September, but in a very gradual way. The middle section, the orange bars, are the aircraft in service and split by age and generation. And finally, on the right, we have the stored aircraft in the same, uh, allocated in the same way. One thing you'll notice is the green checkered box that highlights certain groups. This implies under this scenario, those aircraft will remain in service or will be entering service, whilst others will enter storage or remain in storage and relates to the note provided in the red box at the, in the middle of the graph of charts. The green box we consider to be the safe zone. So taking a look at this scenario in more detail by taking elements of age, efficiency, lease ends and accepting a smaller level of new deliveries plus reactivation of a steady stream of max and other interleased aircraft, there's considerable impact on the current in-service fleet. By removing aircraft over 16 years old and the least efficient assets, we place nearly 3,400 aircraft, narrow-body aircraft, from the in-service fleet, which considers both active and short-term currently parked aircraft into long-term storage. 
In net terms, this equates to a reduction in the narrow body fleet of 7.5%. This figure is based on the overall global scenario, age and type, and doesn't factor in specific deals, relationships, and changes to the delivery stream. If deliveries fall, then based on this scenario, so will the number of aircraft entering storage. Of course, there are many ways in which this scenario can shift in terms of overall numbers beyond 2021. And it's entirely based when, around when demand recovers, the fuel price environment and the ability for OEMs to ramp up production again. It is feasible that oil price could soar as part of the world recovery and the measures taken by oil producing countries that could will, in, sorry, will intensify uh, OEM delivery rates whilst RPK recovery doesn't yet return to 2019 levels and the impact could be worse. Similarly, oil may remain benign. OEMs could fail to return to full pace for several years and demand returns with a ferocity from 2022 and aircraft need to return from storage. But storage, of course, doesn't mean part out. And it's worth noting that part out levels for narrow bodies never reached 300 per year in the past and has been in decline since 2014. Whilst the number that are permanently withdrawn from service, we call it retired, have been on the increase to an average around 300 per year. So that's above the long-term part out average. When confronted with 3,400, it is clear that the removal of 500 part outs until the end of 2021 and some additional retirements and let's say 100 conversions will do very little to shape the overall numbers. Once you part out the aircraft, that will be used to maintain the older conversions. The conversion market will take a good level of stock. The younger generation part out market will tear down some where the airframe condition is low, and then there will be those where lessors have gathered large reserve funds alongside a lower book value. The part out market is not necessarily an option for most of the rest, as the supply and demand of parts and spare engines is a fine balance too, and, it, and offers the counter argument to changing economic life. Although if the storage yards become packed with decent uh, 737NGs and A320 CEOs, the effect on values and, and rates could be far more reaching if demand fails to absorb much of it beyond 2021. So I'm going to move now on to the uh, wide body fleet scenario. This chart is structured in the same way, except this time we have separated the four engined aircraft from the twin engined aircraft. As before, we show the backlog as it stands, show what should have been delivered in the next 20 months starting from today, and the actual number based on OEM estimations released last month. Unsurprisingly, it's been reduced by 50%, although there are no large storage fleets as we have seen with the MAX that we have to consider. The bulk of the deliveries considers 787s, A330neos and A350s, plus a small number of 777X, and 300 ERs that are working through the factory right now. The middle section of the chart covers the in-service fleet and displays the charts ascending in terms of asset risk. So the newest generation of twin jets at the bottom and aging four engine aircraft such as 747 and A340 at the top. On the far right, we have the aircraft currently in storage. Moving back to the scenario we were discussing for the narrow bodies, if we follow the same rules and identify those aircraft most vulnerable from age, technology and lease end exposure, in addition to adding new deliveries, plus reactivating some assets that were in the process of entering service, we established this may affect the wide body market as indicated by the green checkered boxes, those being what we call the safe zones. In terms of numbers, this reduced the number of in-service aircraft by 1,850, leading to a net change of 1,300 aircraft, which is a reduction of over 29%. A much larger relative effect based on the higher expected impacts on higher capacity long range sectors and borne out of the operator activity and announcements made recently. In contrast with the narrow body analysis, the stark difference is the age at which point oversupply levels are reached which unsurprisingly falls close to the average lease termination age. <clears throat> For some lessors, there will be options to extend further, but are there any other viable alternatives with an aircraft that comes off lease, let's say at 10 or 12 years? <clears throat> as before, this is balanced by new deliveries and reactivation, and as every aircraft will present its own challenges, will not follow this definitive division, 
but it's expected to trend in this way. It reaffirms what the market has been pushing towards for some time, that it's efficient twin engine wide bodies that are easier to manage and offer less risk against their larger and less efficient uh, wide body cousins. Once again, this only goes to the end of 2021 and how the market recovers, coupled with oil price production rates, the, the, uh, how the situation will adapt, whereby some of the older 777s and A330s will remain in the market alongside a smaller number of A380s, particularly those ones that have been refitted, but it will be a different landscape. Beyond 2021, like the narrowbody case, low production rates and high demand level could lead to a resurgence in demand for the best kept in storage. Again, what happens to the aircraft whilst in storage will shift to a new gear should this scenario play out. Historically, the highest number of twin engine conversions have been around 30 per year, whilst the number of part outs have not exceeded 150. Therefore, we may only see 50 aircraft convert and 250 being scrapped, with a few more being permanently withdrawn as retirements. A far cry from the 1,850, such that the viability of many A380s entering long-term storage today won't be known until demand returns. Whilst the market appears quite clear-cut when comparing four-engine aircraft to efficient twin engines, the fate of the mid-age 777 and the A330CO market is particularly key. Other questions point towards a slow entry for the 777X, and consequently, will we see operators hold on to 777-300s for longer? Combine, combining the narrow and wide-body cases, we get close to a number of 2,500, although based on new deliveries and reactivation, the impact on the in-service fleet today is in excess of 5,000 units. Looking on the bright side, most OEMs have, have delivered a little over uh, 1,600 aircraft in a single year. If demand recovers back in 2022, it's unlikely delivery rates will be high enough to recover sufficient capacity without the reactivation of reasonable numbers of aircraft. Similarly, with the return of demand, that will re return uh, new business models designed to react to changing consumer demands. So there's a lot of uh, busyness in those charts. If you do have any questions, please uh, do raise them uh, uh, afterwards uh, through Victoria or direct with myself. In terms of the valuation approach, I mean, this is something that, you know, as an appraisal firm, if we, if we provide opinions, we can be accused of uh, perhaps not basing it on actual numbers today. However, as an appraisal firm and with people in our business who, who've, who've been in the avi aviation industry and seen many cycles, I think it's fair that we're asked for an opinion on market values. However, this slide here is very important that we do make sure that you use the right definition. And I think in the blue box here, uh, I won't run through each one of these definitions. For operating lessors, the ISTAT definition for market value seldom suits. Base value or lease encumbered valuation is more relevant. Because really, if you've invested in aircraft that are on lease, you've invested in long-term assets. And if you sell an aircraft and you're looking at market value, the chances are that you'll, you'll be looking into a more of a distressed situation and there will be a problem with a valuation that you had, let's say, based on a year-on-year -year change. So I do I really want to make sure that if you're looking at valuations, be very careful to use the right definition. And please speak to your appraiser, whoever they may be, to make sure that you're not just using a number from a valuation platform, but you are consulting uh, to make sure you're using the right valuation. Uh, I think we're running out of time, but I've got several slides which do now talk about market value because uh, all appraisal firms seem to be looking at these right now. Uh, but this is something that um, I say so I won't go through each one of these in detail. We can we can look at some of the uh, the, the key takeaway points. I mean, we've we've really not taken um, a a massive cut uh, across the board. Uh, there clearly will be. Uh, situations where if, for example, looking at these these charts, we're looking at uh, young aircraft values on the lower left, a three-year-old example, and on the right-hand side, we're looking at some of the older aircraft, 18 years old. So there, there will be reductions compared to where we saw valuations pre-COVID. 
Um, however, um, we, we do think it's very important that each aircraft is considered, um, you know, specifically considered. You will see some headline numbers coming up, I expect. You'll start to see some aircraft being sold, uh, perhaps because there are multiple sales, perhaps because they're in a run-out condition. Uh, and I think you just need to be careful that if you see some headline numbers which are very low, that you consider the, the number of aircraft that were sold and also their condition. Um, even, in the, even in the good times, you know, e even before COVID, we were, we were seeing headline numbers of you know, some 777s being sold at very low prices. I think it was three years ago when uh, Delta uh, took hold of um, uh, 777 from MAS and it was, it was publicized as being you know, at a very low, uh, very low value. But of course, that aircraft didn't define the whole market. So in general here, I just want to say that we expect to see some market value impacts. If you've got anything uh, specific you want to come back to on these, these narrow body market values, then please do so. Um, we're also looking at lease rates. Um, we do expect to see some reduction in lease rates. However, um, there, there is a situation at the moment. I think there will be uh, several lessors will will be scared from the situation. Uh, there are uh, several smaller funds that took hold of aircraft, and perhaps they're not going to be in a, a position where they're now competing in the market. So we have seen some lessors. Uh, uh, BOC Aviation come to mind. They're very active in the, the purchase leaseback sector at the moment, taking advantage of the airline's need for cash. Um, likewise, interest rates at, at an all-time low, uh, how that equates to the real cost of financing, of course. Um, uh, Baldor probably has a, a, a better view on that than myself. Uh, the next slide, we're looking at the, the, the wide-body market value impact. Some of these might be more uh, relevant to you, but as I say, I, I, uh, unless you are specifically having to sell an aircraft uh, in a, in a, on a single sale basis, um, we, we want you to be very careful before you decide to use market values in order of your, in your annual year-end audits. We would argue that perhaps, perhaps base value is, is a better basis. Um, I can see we've, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'll just move on to the lease rate impact. And likewise, yes, we do expect to see some lease rate impact on the on the wide body sector. Um, but I will leave you to digest these uh, in the fullness of time. As I said, if you do need anything uh, specific on these, please feel free to come back to us either directly or via Victoria. Uh, and on that point, uh, Victoria, I. Um, I went through those last slides fairly quickly because I can see we're probably coming up to 13 minutes past the hour. So back to you, Victoria. Thanks very much, Phil. So we've just got a few minutes for questions. And I, I think um, just um, from the questions we've been given is that there is a lot of anxiety out there, particularly in, in Korea, around investors who are perhaps new to the asset class and new to, new to the industry. So I just wanted to bring the, the discussion back to that and ask Balder um, really for what your advice is to those investors that are perhaps you know, getting a little bit scared and perhaps I think some have been, have been saying that they're threatening litigation against the arrangers. I mean, what's your advice to them and, and is rash action now kind of going to create further damage down the line? Well, I, I mean, as I kind of said, Victoria, this is a long-term industry for long-term investors. Uh, we are, we're going through a very difficult time now, but uh, it's not the first time this has happened in the industry. And uh, I, I think uh, what, what we would advise is uh, investors to remain calm and uh, to be patient. If you're in it for the short term, it's uh, basically guaranteed uh, to burn money. So... Uh, what you know, our advice would be, as Mike has shown with the 330 example, uh, what we have seen in past crises is uh, 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 it is better uh, to wait, to work through the crisis, and uh, to to uh, look at things again uh, when 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 times get better. Thank you. And I get a um, question really is for Belder and Mike and, and Phil as well, actually. I bet uh, specifically about the A330s. With so many being parked, 
there's a question about whether or not we can revive that market when the manufacturers are probably pushing A350s and 787s. I know you touched on this in, in your discussions, but perhaps if you could provide a bit more colour about what you think is going to happen to the A330 market once the crisis is over. <coughs> Do you want me to start, uh, Marla? Yeah. Yeah, why don't you go, Mike? Well, firstly, we have to see how many actually come back into service. Um, and uh, no one knows at the moment. I mean, it's easy to uh, predict anything, but you might predict it incorrectly. Uh, so firstly, we have to wait and see uh, what happens. Um, and as I think Phil and Balder and I have been trying to put over uh, that you know if uh, a decision to sort of de-invest now or uh, take action now on an aircraft is a bit premature and there's really um, you'll get what you're probably likely to see that it uh, uh, there's not a very strong market uh, the prices are down uh, I tend to have a um, I, I was going to say more realistic view. I have a more practical view of what how prices are going to go. Uh, and if I can, and it, uh, I think that for there will be some A330s that are you know, 1999, 2000, they're 20 years old, uh, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, which clearly are not going to come well. Uh, have a great chance of not coming back into service and probably will provide feedstock for spares. Uh, but there's still value to be uh, to, to got out of that. But I think that the the A330s that are, uh, and I'm, I'm just picking this figure almost out of the air, but the, there's aircraft that are sort of say less than 10 years old uh, still have the same life in front of them as they do uh, in May 2020, as they did in January 2020, and it uh, there will be. Uh, I think the majority of them will come back in. I think prices will rebound. Um, on the uh, uh, 737-800 isn't an A330, but uh, on the transactions we're doing, one price was agreed before COVID on the 737s. Uh, we've then just spent the next the last two to three weeks renegotiating the prices uh, but uh, you know without giving any confidential information away uh, the differential we agreed on price was not 20 percent not 30 percent it was 10 percent in fact it was just below 10 percent um, against background information coming out from appraisers and I don't necessarily mean you Phil uh, but coming out from appraisers that you know Older aircraft were going to crash. That they were going to the, the drop in values could be up to forty percent. That's kind of in a headline news, but doesn't necessarily. No one knows. And certainly on the one experience we've had so far in renegotiating during a pan, this pandemic, uh, the figures which uh, we negotiated or you know were negotiated between the buyer and seller uh, were you know more realistic. So I think. That I think that it's uh, sorry, Val. Val. No, no, that's. Uh, I mean, I, I share your view, Mike. And you know, indeed, as you say, my observation is the A330s in the Korean market, as far as I'm aware of them, are all somewhere in the you know six to eight year range, and uh, those aircraft clearly have plenty of uh, useful life left. So uh, there is a future for them. There will be a future for them after the crisis. And uh, yeah, the, the thing to do right now is, uh, unfortunately, but uh, sit tight, uh, wait, uh, get get through the crisis as uh, was done uh, in your example, and then uh, uh, keep managing the aircraft uh, after the crisis. This means the investment for the investors may be longer than expected. But it does not mean that investors will a lose money or b will not may not be able to get the yield they were hoping for. It is just uh, the fact that uh, this may take longer than expected. Thank you, Thank Bill. You, Bill. Uh, Bill, did you want to say anything quickly? 
Um, no, I mean, I think if you, uh, yeah, I, I take on board what Mike is saying, you know, I think appraisers, um, you know, I think sometimes the numbers that you see are, are, are because there's, there's a desire to come up with a, a headline number or make the news, which is why I've been emphasizing today that, you know, um, uh, you, you have to be very careful. Each aircraft is different. Every scenario is different. Every configuration of the aircraft will be different. So, you know, and where the aircraft is ending up, which is, you know, why Mike is emphasizing the, that remarketing side uh, is very important to get right um, to extract the most value. Thanks, Phil. Um, we're out of time, I'm afraid. So if you have any more questions, do send them to me and I can send them over to our speakers. I can also share the slides if you'd like, to, so please request those as well. Um, so just to say thank you to all of our speakers, Belda, Mike, and Phil, and um, good luck to everybody out there, and we'll join you on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.